Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff. This is the AAS Journal Author Series. And I'm super happy to have Paula Scotti with us today. Hi, Paula. Hi, Frank. Nice hey. to be here. Oh, well, thank you so much for agreeing to talk about your really lovely article on this September 29th of 2021. We are past the equinox. Uh, and so where are you located where equinox happened? I'm in Seattle, Washington. I'm spending half of my time up in our in the San Juan Islands wow. as a safer place in the last couple of years, but mm -hmm. we alternate back and forth. Okay. So I'm now in my office. Uh, it's nice to be back in my office. I Is feel like I could work better in my office. Is this the first time you've been back in your office since the since the start of the pandemic? No, we come back once in a while and we've often been there. We have a big building of six stories mm -hmm. and my husband's also an astronomer. So we come in, we're the only people on our floor and we've been the only people in the building at times. Wow, good, good. Now there's more people. University, this is our first day of classes for fall quarter. Oh, okay. So there's a lot of students around. Are you teaching this fall? No, I'm I'm emeritus, so I finished my teaching a year ago. I did my last class virtually. <laughs> and we were given two weeks notice, and we had to convert all our classes over, and that was my last one. Wow, well, um, congratulations. So now you're just all research all the time. Well, plus AAS. Plus you have other duties, I hear. <laughs> Which takes a little bit of my time. Just a little bit, just a little bit. Oh, yeah. Uh, but that's awesome. We all research all the time and we're teaching. I'm jealous. I'm jealous. It's like being a graduate student again. Exactly. Like yeah, I, yeah, or postdoc, because you know, maybe been around the block once or so. So very cool. Uh Paula, what do you like to do for research? So my research is on cataclysmic variables, and I wish I had my little picture that I usually show, but I'll have to describe what it is. Um, these are two stars that are very close to each other, separated by the diameter of the sun, basically, one of which is a white dwarf, and the other is mass transferring, usually a light main sequence star, but could be a brown dwarf kind of object, uh, transfers material over to the white dwarf. Um, so I work on them looking at, so there's lots of different aspects involved here. Mm -hmm. The white dwarf can work on the individual stars, the secondary star, you can work on main sequence stars. Um, you can work on the accretion disk, which happens when the mass transfer happens around the white dwarf. So there's accretion disk physics. We can work on magnetic fields because some of these uh, good fraction of the, these systems have very high magnetic field white dwarfs. And by high, I mean 10 to 250 mega gauss fields. Mm -hmm. And so we can study really the magnetic, how magnetic uh, accretion differs from just normal disk accretion. Uh, there's a spin up of the star, so we can study how angular momentum affects the long term evolution of these systems. White dwarfs are the most common endpoint in the galaxy, so there's lots of these things in the galaxy. There's millions as compared to like, you usually hear more about the black holes in the neutron star yeah, system. Yeah, yeah. Oh, those, those numbers are piddly compared to <laughs> uh, cataclysmic variables, which are you know all over the place, and and they're close by, so we can you yes, know, I hope. distances. So um, there's really a lot of different parts of uh, CV research, and so I mean I spent my whole career, you know, I what I'm almost up to 50 years now studying these things, so. Uh, but there's a lot of things that still need to be uh, understood, and there's always something new popping up. So it's 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 an interesting field, and I'm I'm so glad that I that I took this field <laughs> when I started. Very cool. Oh. Very cool. Uh, so speaking of uh, you know returning to research and, and grad students, you re reminded me of a quick story before we get to the the article. Uh, yeah, when I was a grad student, uh, I took uh, I took my cataclysmic variable class from uh, Bob Kraft. Oh wow, he was he was one of the founders yeah. of this. Yeah, yeah. I remember. Uh, yeah, those days. And finally, he was, he was an undergrad here, so he was. Yeah, he has connections. Oh, really, I didn't know none of that. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. Wow, what a connection. From Washington, yeah. So yeah. he's come back. He came back several mm -hmm. times to visit us and nice. do different things. Yeah. Very cool. And with that, we're going to share this very lovely article on cataclysmic variables in the second year of the Zuki Transit Facility. And Paula, take us away. 
All right, well, this is the second, as the title implies, of two papers that I come out from this um, sky survey. Mm -hmm. So I think you've had, uh, I know Ryan talked about the, a um, little bit about CVs and surveys and uh, mm -hmm. all different kinds of surveys that have been going out. So this is like the third iteration okay. of a sky survey that's been taking place <clears throat> at Palomar on the 48 inch. And um, the first ones uh, had a different camera. And so when they started the, this one is named for Fred Zucchi, okay. uh, they really improved the camera. So it's a, it's a camera that has a very large field of, field of view. Um, and it, they changed the way that the sky is sampled. Um, so most other surveys like uh, Catalina and the uh, Master OT, Mm -hmm. um, they survey basically every couple nights um, and they avoid the galactic plane because of the crowding. So it's really difficult to really distinguish and, and get a good measurement of objects in the crowded fields. So, and they, and they usually do it in unfiltered light, which for a CCD is kind of reddish light. So um, the differences of the Zwicky facility um, besides having a larger field of view to cover you know, large swaths of the sky at, at, at once, um, is they have multiple filters and they sample um, nightly the galactic plane. Nice. And so there's um, many more uh, opportunities for figuring out what things are from light curves. So when you're, when you're trying to do things just from a light curve, it's really, you, there's, you know, the facility gets, you know, there's uh, many, many objects, which are millions that are coming through the uh, sky survey every night. And mm -hmm. the trick is to try to figure out how you find the object of your interest out of that sky survey. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that, uh, this is a facility that's run by Caltech and um, here's, we're having a, <laughs> we're having a siren go by here. Real life, um, we love it. <laughs> it'll, it'll pass. Um, so, uh, so Caltech has started the survey. Uh, Tom Prince and Shri Kukarni were the ones who got the funding from NSF and then the partner institutions each contributed. And in the first part of the survey went for two years. Okay. And UW, or my institution, um, was, part, was one of the partners. Unfortunately, we didn't have enough money to join this now because it's now in its second year uh, or second iteration, not the second year because it went yes. for two years. We're now in like the three-year extension. Uh, but I remained as a collaborator because I'm one of the, the co-chairs of, of one of the um, uh, science uh, groups of the galactic plane. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, so uh, Caltech started this um, and they, on the, on the 48 inch, um, but they also have the 60 inch that's at Palomar as well. Mm -hmm. And they have what's called the CDM. It's a low resolution uh, spectrograph on it. So you can take spectra of sources that are found to be interesting in the, um, in the ZTF. So that's one of the great advantages besides the, the survey itself, which has the multicolors and the galactic plane coverage. Uh, it has a, a opportunity for follow up, and so that's you know part of what what I do and part of what this paper is presenting okay. um, is using the um, sky survey to sort through and find objects of interest, and then do some follow up. And I uh, UW has a twenty five percent share of the Apache Point Observatory in New Mexico, so that's primarily where I've been doing a lot of my follow up. Although. We've been having some instrument problems with our spectrograph. Mm -hmm. uh, we're converting over to a new one. And so this last year or so, besides being the shutdown for the pandemic, um, mm -hmm. there's been a, a big halt to some of the follow-up spectra that are going on. Yeah. But uh, let me say a little bit more about how I select the sources. So, um, because that involves a lot of these people that are here on the author list. Um, many of them are students. So uh, Claire, uh, Brad, uh, Brooke um, uh, are students here. We're students. They've all gone on to graduate schools here. Uh, Anna um, was a student at, at Caltech. Mm -hmm. And then the other people listed there are all part of the, what we call the builders of the survey who contributed to making the facility work. One of the important people uh, should be in there, Monzi. Uh, uh, Kasiwal, 
Yep. He developed the way that I did the searches primarily. It's called the Growth Marshal. And the Growth Marshal is a web-based interface where uh, you can put in a filter uh, which takes all the alerts that are coming in each night mm -hmm. and you filter them out. And my filter, which was built by Anna mm -hmm. in the early days, Anna Ho, mm -hmm. um, is used to, because um, a lot of, there's a lot of variability in um, cataclysmic variables and it's impossible to catch all of the types of variability in the filter. But we do concentrate on the ones that have dwarf novi outbursts, which is a disk instability and increased accretion onto the white dwarf. It causes a rise of brightness um, by two to nine magnitudes mm -hmm. within one night. So part of our filter is just the range and variability from the observation that took place the last mm -hmm. night compared to a reference image, which is compi compiled from 15 observations or more of the source. And so usually with 15 observations, you're going to get the, the, the cataclysmic variable at its quiescent or lowest magnitude state. Uh -huh. And then if, either, if it rose during the last night by two or more magnitudes, that triggers part mm -hmm. of the filter. Okay. And then we also filter on the color because these things, because the white dwarf and the accretion that's going on, the systems are generally bluer than most other um, kinds of variables. Okay. Um, and so we have a cut in the color from G minus R of uh, less than, um, bluer than 0 0.6. And the latest, you know, in the current time, we've expanded that color because it looks like we're missing some. Okay. So anyhow, in looking, so every night, one of the students or myself would go through these, um, the filter produced, the growth marshal produces a nice light curve of the object for the last 30 days. And so you can look at the jump and sort of look at it and say, mm, well, does that look like a dwarf nova or is it a flare star or is it R or Lyra or whatever? So usually we're getting up to 200 sources that would pass the filter each night. And sometimes, you know, if the weather's bad, there'd be nothing, um, but it could be, you know, you're looking at 200 objects every single night. And if you miss a night, then you maybe miss the outburst. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, and you have to, you have to sort of keep up because you have to save the object. So the, the growth marshal has a capability. So after sorting through these every night, you would have a save and it would put it into a list. And so you could then go back to that list and you and would keep going with the observations. It would keep up, keep recording all the observations for the ones that you have saved. Okay. Okay, so the end result is these two papers. So over the span, so I divided it into the first year, which included a lot of just getting up to speed uh, getting the filters to work right, et cetera. And then the second year, we're just running with the filter we had. Um, and that's what this paper is. Um, nice. But each, each paper in each one, so we basically took this list of all of our saved objects and went through them. And this is what most of the students did. Um, went through each object and looked at looked it up in Simbad uh, and in the AVSO. Um, yep. A uh, list of things to find out if if it was no previously known, uh, what its past references in the literature were. If it was, we went through the CRTS, the Catalina survey, the Assassin surveys to see if it, that object had been picked up in each of those. We went through Gaia to find if a distance was uh, was obtained. And the second paper, we had better Gaia distances than we did in the first paper. Um, as the what is it? The third, is it the third guy? Yeah, we're in year three. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it took a lot of work. So, you know, we, we spent the year just calling through this list and finding, you know, you know, a lot of typo mistakes. It was, you know, it was a mess. When you're dealing with hundreds of objects, it's it's time consuming to get each one right. So we're, we're pretty, pretty sure we have things right here. So I divided the objects into, um, the ones that were previously known and confirmed. And the problem is, what do you, what do you call confirmed here? And that's this first table. Um, 
so what we did is so we have the the coordinates of course because ztf has this weird labeling system where the letters don't mean anything to anybody but the ztf team uh -huh. um, but the real way to to identify objects is through the coordinates um the ra and deck um and then the b is a galactic latitude so you, we could tell which ones were um within most of the previous surveys were within like 10 degrees of the galactic plane um so we were really seeing how many from the what we could do in the ztf survey were how much was the improvement for the ones that were closer to the plane and in the first paper we we're getting a lot more because in addition to the normal survey that was going on as part of the uh, 40 percent that was um funded by nsf and public there was the 40 percent partnership mm -hmm. and the partnership data did some extensive monitoring of the plane uh, with many more up many more measurements and so there were many more objects close to the plane in paper one than in this one mm -hmm. um, then in, in the after the the first phase after the first two years um uh the the survey switched to doing some other things other than this increased cadence of the plane they were still doing the nightly ones, but not oh, so together. So they're slightly less uh, close to the plane in this paper than the previous one. Okay. Uh, the delta mag is the measurement that we could see from um, when it was at the quiescent state, which is basically the reference image, mm -hmm. uh, and how much it increased in an outburst. So it gives a sense of the range of the outburst. So you can see some of those are like five magnitudes, some of our just a couple. Uh, the problem is that when you get down to like 21st magnitude, those are kind of like upper limits. You can't really go past that. So if you, something was like 23rd magnitude not detected, but then rose up to 18th or something, we wouldn't know the true range. So this is like a lower limit to the actual outburst range that the object could have. But the, most of them are several magnitudes. Mm -hmm. And because of the Gaia, uh, the P is the, the Gaia parallax measurement, uh, we, it can then have a distance. And you see that that most are within a few hundred uh, parsecs. A couple get up to a kiloparsec, but they're pr pretty yep. close compared to other things like supernova, et cetera, that are studied in other galaxies. Yep. And so, with the distance and the um, quiescent magnitude there, we can convert to an absolute magnitude of the source. Yep. Um, and then the outburst column is how many outbursts we we actually saw in the in the range that we set up. And so the the paper gives. The range in the first year was like the first, I can't remember the actual dates would end, but basically one year's worth of data. And this paper is the second year's worth of data. And so it's the number of outbursts per year, basically, or within that range. And you can see that, you know, there's some of them have, look at that one that has 13 outbursts. So uh, four if Novi have a full range. Um, some of them can outburst every week. The normal range is every couple months, there'll be an outburst. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the ones that are called SOBs mm -hmm. uh, isn't what you think it stands for. It's super outburst. Super outburst. <laughs> uh, uh, so yeah. those, those there's just one. So one okay. a year. And those are the things that we're trying to catch because mm -hmm. as the mass, there's been many theoretical papers as to, you know, what is the relationship between the mass transfer rate and the number of outbursts. And basically what happens is as you get to lower and lower mass transfer rates, it takes a long time for the disk to build up, and the outburst time time between outbursts gets gets very long. And they can be some of the systems I work on um, with part of my research, other than the Zwicky, is the um, the ones that have outbursts that are like twenty or thirty years, once every twenty or thirty years. And these are the really the very lowest uh, mass transfer rate. So what we're looking for, those are the ones that are not picked up always and see it. So, I mean, every survey finds new object and it's like, well, why wasn't it discovered in this past survey? It's bright enough. But the, the reason often is that um, the only outburst once every 20 years, you've got to wait 20 years for an outburst. So we're catching some of these ones that have SOBs we're catching as like the first time they've gone into to an outburst. Um, cool. Very cool. Uh, so that's the ones we're trying to find because evolutionary theory predicts that uh, as the systems evolve from orbital periods of several hours down to the, the lowest period near an hour and a half or so, 70 mm -hmm. minutes, um, they're, they're, 
they should be the ones that have the lowest mass white dwarfs, uh, lowest mass secondaries, and the lowest rates of mass transfer. And so they should have the least frequent outbursts. And so those are the ones we're trying to find, the ones that are basically what we call it a period turnaround where the secondary is going to become degenerate instead yeah. of the normal main sequence star. And those are the ones that the surveys, because the, the first surveys, if they were all sky, picked up the ones 12, you know, 12 to 15th magnitude, it's pretty rare to find a new one of those. Most of the ones we're picking up now are the ones down near 20, 21st magnitude. Yeah. Um, but the question is, has been before Gaia, are these things, if you go over to table two, so these are the ones that are already known objects. So on the, I guess I didn't finish the rest of the, the columns here, but okay. um, after the outburst, there's the um, the days that of coverage that we have, because you know sometimes this wiki went down for some reason or something, we don't have coverage for some reason, yeah. whether it's in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey mm -hmm. uh, and whether it has a spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, and the ones, not all sources in the in Sloan uh, have have spectra, but the spectra it provides, in my view, to really confirm an object. You can you can get a pretty good idea from the light curve, but to really do a confirmation, there should be a spectrum to show that it has emission lines. Mm -hmm. That is the signature uh, bomber emission, and sometimes helium and helium two emission. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the basic signature of a CV. So. We've looked at and the other surveys shows you how they've been identified if they have a variable star name, um, B1047 Aquilae, B351 UMA. So those are the things that are in SIMBAD and in the VSX and AVSO that they're known. Okay, so we separate out the knowns. And if you go down to table two, uh, those are the ones that are candidates. Some have been seen in Assassin, which is good, but if they don't have a spectrum, <laughs> Right. Um, yeah. Right. <laughs> not really confirmed. So well, many of these are, are very likely. These are good CV candidates. They look the light from the light curves. They look like CVs. But if someone wants to do follow up work, um, and this is why one of the reasons Ryan, um, we put out this uh, web based catalog of all of the objects that are coming through Assassin, etc. So people that have spectrographs can go through and actually do a confirmation that these are indeed CVs. The trick with doing a spectral confirmation though, is you have to catch it at the right time. If you take an object at outburst when it's brightest and when it's easiest to get a spectrum, you're not gonna see much. It's gonna look like the accretion disk is very thick. It yeah. just looks like a blue continuum. Yeah. Well, that's what you'd expect, but it's not a confirmation and you wanna see the line. So you have to catch it basically near quiescence. But acquiescence is 21st magnitude, right, for many of these. And so you'd need really a Gemini or a Keck to get a, a good spectrum. So that's the problem. So you can cheat a little bit by catching it on the decline okay. outburst, right? Halfway up where it's still bright enough to, to get a good spectrum and the lines will still, they're not going to be as strong as acquiescence, but right. you should be able to see them. Okay. The trick is, as I'll show in the figures, it's sometimes hard to tell when it's going to go down. So if you have to schedule, even the scheduling the SEDM, oh. you know, a night or two, you don't know exactly when it's going to be on the decline and at the right magnitude to get it. So there's some tricks involved in, in trying to do the confirmation. But you know, we, we've done the best we could. And as I said, in paper one, when we had APO and we had more of the resources. In paper two, because of the Caltech connection, uh, and participation and Jan on, and others on the on that list were able to land, we're able to get spectra of some of these things and um, we could actually confirm what they look nice. like. So maybe go down to the figures, figure one. Yeah. And we'll put a link in the video below to uh, Ryan's uh, OpenCV catalog. Um, okay, great. Well. So we'll do that. Uh, but yeah, we've got quite a number of candidates. Right? Yeah, so each paper we had, 300 some in each yeah. paper. So we've got like 700 total. Now it's not complete because as I said, we have, I'll say a little bit more at the end, uh, we run some other tests in different ways. It turns out, it depends on the filter you're using and how you're doing the search. So every everybody doing the search finds different things based on how they're filtering out these hundreds of objects that we need. Um, and in the hundreds of objects out of those 200, Maybe 10 would be CVs and the rest would be basically 
for us garbage, our Lyra's long period variables, or sorts of things. So that's the trick, how to get from the 200 to the 10, five or 10. And it's, and it's gonna be much more of a problem for, for Vera Rubin, because <laughs> you're gonna have a million, you know, yeah. you're gonna have not hundreds, you're gonna have thousands every night. Yes. And yeah, so this is what some of the light curves look like. Um, and this is what you're facing and trying to decide, is this a CV or not? Mm -hmm. um, and there's a huge range of behaviors. So the upper left one there uh, is, is more of a typical. So the straight red line, so the co it's color coded by the filters there, uh, mm -hmm. G and, G and, G and R and I. Um, so uh, we, had, we had G being green, but then you can't use, journals don't like green oh, and red because it's color blind. blind. Uh, uh, problem. So we had to, we changed our, our colors here, but the, the red is basically, um, you know, the quiescent level. Yeah. And there's a couple points below, which are a little bit unusual, but you know, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. part of variability could be an eclipse. Maybe so when you see something below the mean line could mean it's an eclipsing system, but it would take follow-up, you know, intensive follow-up. As I said, the periods, because these things are so close together, the orbital periods are, are on the order of one and a half to say three or four hours, typically. So in one night of observation, you can actually cover up the whole orbit and figure out if it's eclipsing, if you're doing photometry or if you're doing spectra, you can get a whole radio velocity curve for the entire orbit. So it's really nice. These are nice things to work on. <laughs> you know, it's because because the time scale is a human an observer's time scale. Okay, so the one on the left shows, you know, three outbursts. So you see they're pretty quick. If you and and ZTA, the growth marshal has a way that you can actually expand the plots and look at the details of the outburst. Uh -huh. Um but so you know those are fairly rapid outbursts. The mm -hmm. one on the upper right this is, this is what a super outburst looks like. You can yeah. see that it lasts for 20 days. So there's a good chance we would catch it even with bad weather, uh, you know, on Palomar, et cetera, or something going around the instrument, we would probably catch it. Mm -hmm. The shape is very distinctive. There's this fast rise, yep. like a day. Dang. And then there's that little plateau shelf there, <laughs> that linear shelf. Mm -hmm. And that is the extended disc. It's reached some radius and it stays there for a while. And then there's the rapid decline. Mm -hmm. And then you see that little uh, point that goes high again right after the decline. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they have these recurring uh, outbursts on the decline sometimes and, and it before it completely goes down to right. its yeah. level. Bang. Yeah. Sometimes there could be five or six, I think. Mm -hmm. Maybe even 10 of these rebrightening events that happen. Right. And that's a characteristic of just the components and the mass transfer rates in the system. So these are kind of interesting systems to follow. They probably have all of these things have massive, relatively massive white dwarfs. The, the masses that have been determined are all around eight tenths to one solar mass, whereas normal white dwarfs are pretty much clustered around six tenths for a hydrogen white dwarf. Right. Um, okay, so the bottom left. Yeah. shows that there's a lot of upper limits there. Yep. Uh, and then it goes up to being recognized. And this is what we call a high low state. It's not an outburst, but you see that it, la it can last for what, uh, 200 days? Yes. Most of the time it's in the high state, but sometimes it goes into these lows. Okay. Um, and we don't know why they huh. think shut off. Uh -huh. These are systems which the accretion rates are generally very high, so they don't develop this disk instability like the, the two on the top. Mm -hmm. uh, but all of a sudden, it can shut off. And the time scale for the shut off can be quite rapid or it can be slow and decline into one of these low states. Okay. The advantage of, I mean, at the high state, there's lots of bright emission lines. There's usually helium two, it's high excitation. There's a lot of mass transfer. But the most interesting times to get a spectrum are at the low states because then basically the disk is gone yep. and you can actually look at the underlying stars and see what's there. So um, usually you can see the white dwarf is hot. It usually is heat, it heats a portion of the secondary. So if you identify it's an M star, uh, you can do around the orbit and see the heating effect from the white dwarf onto the M star. Um, so lots of interesting things. The spectrum is totally different uh, at the low state versus the high state. Mm -hmm. um, but you want to be able to, and that's the advantage of these sky surveys. You have to try to identify from the light curve 
the best time to try to observe. And then we use multi-wavelength. So for example, um, we now have a HST program with a big consortium international of 132 orbits, some of which are to catch the low states so that we can actually identify the temperature of the white dwarf accurately um, and the component stars. So um, this would be like this, looking at the light curves will be the trigger um, to, to ask for our tar target of opportunity time. Um, okay, and then again, the one on the lower right doesn't look like a whole lot, but that's, I put that one in there because we have spectrum on this one, which yeah, looks pretty interesting. So um, sometimes you can't always, that's the problem. Some of the ones that are saying, look at the light curve, how would that ever be uh, a CVs? But then it, you look at it, well, this is a known CV. So, you know, why isn't it showing some of the behavior that we're seeing in some of the others? So there's just, it's just a widespread of things. Um, and really it takes individual study of the unusual objects to figure out what's going on and, and learn some new characteristics about accretion. So nice. I think at the, I would say go to the spectra now, maybe figures out figure two. Yeah, okay. Two, yes, two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, mm -hmm. this is a spectra taken with, um, from Keck, okay, because this is what APO was down. Like, we probably could have done this because they're, well, the bottom one at least we could have done with, with APO. And I'm gonna actually try to get some more data on that uh, in, in a run I have next week. Um, but so this is, the top one is a typical spectrum. This is the one of the object that was in the figure one um, that doesn't look like much, but this is what you'd expect for a typical uh, CV, co confirms it as a CV. So there's very strong uh, hydrogen lines. Uh, the decrement is fairly flat. Um, because of the disk characteristics, there's helium lines, there's 5870, 5876, uh, 4471, um, those are helium-1 lines. The bottom one is even more interesting because yeah. besides the helium-1 lines, there's helium-2 at 4686 next to H beta. Ooh, okay. Yeah, and that's what we're looking for. So that when that helium-2 is, is present there, there's a good chance that it's either having a magnetic white dwarf, which has different, it has high impact accretion, okay. uh, or it's one of these, what we call SW sex stars that exist between orbital periods of three to four hours, which also have a strong helium two. Okay. Um, and they may have a different evolution. They may have gone through a different sequence. They may be being born younger there. There's a lot of explanations for what causes that peculiar uh, region of, th of between three and four hours. Mm -hmm. Those are also the ones that, that tend to go, the Nova likes in there, they tend to go into these high and low states. Yeah. Um, so this would be a high state. When you see a spectrum like this, it's definitely not a low state. Uh, and it's, it, it's hard to tell if it's a magnetic system. Um, and so this is one of the ones that we would, we would flag for further orbital follow-up to, to determine the orbital period. If it's between three and four hours, it's probably an SW6. Uh, if it's uh, polars with magnetic uh, white dwarfs can be anywhere uh, across the, the orbital period range, usually a very short period, shorter mm -hmm. period. And they would have different characteristics in terms of you get higher resolution, um, you can see components in the lines. Um, so that's also part of what we do for the follow-up studies. Okay, so that's how we, that's the identification part, how we're doing in time. Um, so the next step, well, one of the steps besides doing the confirming which ones and follow up on interesting sources is to just do a compendium of data that is there. So if you go to some yeah. of the other plots, let's see. So what we've done is, okay, what do we have here? Um, these are some more spectra. So the one on the bottom there, um, shows the, uh, you know, something close to outburst. That's what it looks like in outfits. If you're really at outburst, you would not see any lines. You just see that blue continuum is not very helpful. Right. <laughs> so right. it's a hot source. But this one we caught on the slight decline. So it has a very strong H alpha. Picking up, yeah, yeah. H alpha. Yeah. Up a little bit here. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's definitely a CV. So this is how we do the confirmation. And that top one, this is the really faint sources. <laughs> This is, yeah, you see it's it's very noisy, but there's that little blip at H alpha. <laughs> okay. That's what we get, right. Yeah, yeah, a little blip. <laughs> okay, so be, this one, based on the light curve plus seeing H alpha, it's confirmed. 
good for a candidate. All right. At least it, it, that's what that's our criteria. Okay. okay. Um, all right. So let's go to the next. Okay. So here's the plots. Uh, so this is the numbers as a function of galactic latitude. So um, as I said in paper one, there was a big uh, clump uh, between minus five and, and minus 10 and plus 10. It's not so clear here, but they are more concentrated toward the plane versus out of the plane. Yeah. And I think on the, yeah, we put them all together um, in the in the one on the right. And you can see that we're, we're doing a good, fairly good sampling, uh, especially at minus five there. This, so these are, it's how you do the binning. These are what five, five degree bins in latitude. Um, but there's very strong, we're seeing m many more closer to the plane than the past surveys, yeah. um, which is what we expect. But you know, the problem is what we wanted to do is like get an, you know, a real number of the distribution in, as of galactic height. Yeah. revolutionary population studies, but we're not complete. And that's the problem to, to do this right. You have to know you're getting all the sources in all those areas. And as I said, it, you know, it is hard. I haven't, you know, we get a picture of the field in the, in the growth and the, the ones near the plane are so crowded. Um, we can still pick out, you know, the really strong outburst ones, but, uh, but often if it's, if it's, extremely crowded, it's hard to tell which object um, and, and to get an accurate magnitude range for the for the outburst. So it's re it is really hard to work near the plane, but it's worth it because you're, you're getting so many more objects. Any more if you get it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. What is the, the bottom one? Go up a little bit there. Uh, uh, what do we have on the bottom? Oh, absolute magnitude. Okay. So because of the Gaia and in, in this paper, we had many more um, Gaia magnitudes available. Um, at least for the confirmed ones, it's still the unconfirmed ones are faint. And so I think the next release, because it's adding on, it's going fainter and fainter, yeah. uh, magnitudes will get, will get even more in the next release of Gaia. But you can see that it's skewed toward uh, faint absolute magnitudes. Mm -hmm. That's what we expect, you know, as the systems evolve, uh, the population models have predicted there should be, I mean, the original, predictions where 90% of cataclysmic variables should be at this low mass transfer faint end in terms of the evolution, mm -hmm. um, because it takes them a long time to get down to the, the point where the periods are, are, are short mm -hmm. and you identify them as CVs. Um, and so that is exactly what we're seeing. The, the faintest ones are at, at that low end, but we didn't, you know, you don't really know are the faintest. So because of Gaia, we can tell that the faintest ones are the are actually close by. So the question is, and they're not faint because they're far away that we're seeing them. They're faint because they're actually they have low mass transfer. Okay. They're 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 close by and just intrinsically faint um, because of their component stars. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, go on down here. What else do we have in here? Uh, oh, so we're just looking at this plot of how the absolute magnitude uh, changes with outburst and what we're finding, the, the predictions are as the theoretical predictions as you go to um, lower mass transfer rates and therefore fainter systems, mm -hmm. uh, you should have less outbursts, but when the outbursts do happen, they should be super outbursts with very large mm -hmm. outbursts and that's what we're seeing. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So the frequency it's kind of all over the place. So you get large and small all over, but it's basically the amplitude is, is you know, seems to be bearing out. Uh, and that's okay. the theoretical models are correct. Cool. Sorry. Oh, and here's just some more uh, examples of some peculiar ones that we found. And this is, again, this just shows you the range, but that's the fun part. Sorting through these light curves, I, you know, and the students found it, I think to be fun as well. Although it's really hard to tell exactly what you're dealing with. So the one on the upper right, the 1736, uh -huh. you see when it comes down, there's that little shelf. Yeah, there's like a ledge. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's the characteristics. The, we call those standstills. There's a, a type of CV that's right near the boundary of being a nova-like that never has outbursts because it's high mass transfer all the time, except when it turns off and goes into low states uh, and having dwarf nova instabilities that creates this mm. outburst. So if they're right at that level, they can get kind of get stuck. The disk gets stuck in the size that it is near outburst. Yeah. It's usually like a half a magnitude below the, the peak and it can stay there up 
some of them stay there for years um, and others stay for a week or so. So that you can see that this one, you know, it, it halts there and then goes down. So mm -hmm. this is likely as a cam. So again, we should get a spectrum to make sure it's indeed a high mass transfer. And yeah. then the one below that 1848 has that, it has the shape of a super outburst from the fast rise and it has that like plateau, but the plateau is like cut in half. It has this like huge dip that almost yeah. goes down and then comes back up. Uh -huh. And that's one of these kinds of, again, this is one of the situations that has, uh, you know, characteristic of the components of the CV low mass transfer. It's a short per orbital period is a type of what we call a WZ Sagitti system. Uh, Cato has all these papers that identify these five different kinds of dwarf novae. And this is yeah. one of the five, but it's, it's, it's a rare type. There's not, I don't know, it's only a handful known like this. So this is, mm. this is a fun one to find. Um, and so these others are just, you know, again, the one on the left is probably low and high states. You can see how it, you know, stays low and then comes up for a while. Mm -hmm. and then goes down. But you can see what the problem is in trying to identify some of these things. Um, you know, you really need it. The spectrum is the clincher is ter in terms of telling you what, what you actually have there. Mm -hmm. Nice. Nice. All right. And so let me say a little bit. The last section here is the completeness. So... <laughs> We have been using, as I said, the growth and the growth marshal is now kaput and has trans, well, they decided to end it because they came up with a better one called the Fritz Marshall. Okay. Uh, this is only available to Caltech again and Fritz has more capabilities, uh, but we had to transform, transform all the fil filters we had in the growth and Jan von Rostel is the one who did this for our group, our CV group. Okay. Um, he's got a much better filter now. It took a couple iterations, uh, but we're now using Fritz. Um, and we've got it down to, or he's got it down to, so there's only like 50 candidates to search each night instead of several hundred because of the filtering that's, that's being done in the Fritz. Um, the other way, so, so we've had the growth and we have the Fritz um, in terms of Marshall's, web-based Marshall's that you're just looking at the light curves. There's also a, a section um, of ZTF from the, from the Caltech group that is doing machine learning. So they've been working on, this is Michael uh, Kratton and Jan uh, Van Rostel are, have a couple of papers out yep. uh, yep. about a catalog. So, so they're doing the machine learning and the machine learning um, works on the, all of the likers available through the whole project. Mm -hmm. uh, it only uses objects. So, so the, the alerts will give you limits, lower and upper limits, lower limits. Uh, what, or am I going the right way? Anyhow, they, it will give you a limit if it's not detected, okay? So the alerts will, will you show you the limit. The machine learning has to have an actual measured magnitude at the low state. Uh -huh. okay. So it will do a search in a different way, but the light curves are much more complete. So instead of looking at 30 days and maybe missing things in your nightly searches, Mm -hmm. uh, the machine learning looks at the whole swath. So we did a, a cross check <laughs> once they were getting the machine. The machine learning is an online going thing and it's working toward putting out a big catalog of everything that can be classified. Um, I think they're trying to get that catalog out by the end of the year. We'll see whether they make it or not. Uh, but it's been a long process to get the training of the computer to recognize what these things are and classify them. Sure. So anyhow, so Jan ran, we ran a test for one month uh, with me using the growth and he, he was using the machine learning and he was finding many more than we were, but of the ones, of the many more, only 25% were considered thought to be CV. So the classifier wasn't quite doing it right at that point. But I, if I was missing a lot of his and he was missing a lot of mine because of this lower magnitude limit. Uh -huh. So, you know, and there are other people, I mean, people are using Lasser, some of these other uh, broker, Antares. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Whatever broker you use depends on what filter you're using to look through the alerts. Mm -hmm. So how you set your filter determines what you find. And so... Who's going to be complete? I mean, we what we should be doing. That's one of the things we wanted Ryan's catalog to do is try to collect as much as we could from all of these surveys that are being done, so we have a much more complete picture. But again, it takes you can you can think something as a CV, and unless you go 
you'd have to go and cross check every single one to, to see what's been done and actually get a spectrum to see if it really is a CV. Because there's a lot of false, you know, there's some okay. false things in there. <laughs> and as you can see from the from the light curves, you can't really tell. But you can get some hints. So I, I mean, it, it's it's helpful to narrow things down. And yes. and what we're looking for is the oddballs. It's it's really hard to 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 get rid of all the things that are not CVs and then just the run of the mail CVs because right. there's thousands now, right? We've got oh, just you know 700 alone from not being complete on ZTF and then just the last few years. Then all these other surveys are, are producing things as well. So there's you know thousands of CVs known. So what you want to do is is find the ones that show something peculiar that can give you some insight into the right. creation process and the way that outburst happens and the way that evolution happens. Uh -huh. So that's that's the end point. The name of the game. Yeah. Cool. Very nice. Very nice. Paula, thank you so much for walking us through your really lovely article. And you kind of hinted at it a couple of times. Um, so let me ask you to give it a future look. Where do we go, let's say, over the next couple of years? Is there going to be a year three, a year four? Uh, you mentioned Rubin, um, perhaps LSST. Um, are there theoretical work that could be done uh, to help uh, pick out some, some of these oddballs? So, oh, there's a lot of theoretical work, especially with the magnetic systems, the magnetic accretion, and especially why the mass transfer just turned off. Yes. I mean, the idea is it's star spots on the secondary passing across the l1 point but you know that's never really been proven it's just an idea because we haven't don't have any other ideas that work mm -hmm. uh so the theory has a lot to go and then just the theory of accretion does what does the quiescent accretion de this like? distribution look like no one really totally understands okay. viscosity of an of an accretion disk at the low state the high states are easier to no. you know, steady state maybe um but the low state is is up in the air still um but in terms of uh, future, as I said, Vera Rubin Observatory, LSST, is going to be producing so many more of these things. And ultimately, we want to map out the millions in the galaxy and their distribution across the sky. Now, LSST is not concentrating on the plane per se. There's, we're still trying to, uh, I'm, I'm a member of the Transient Variable uh, Stars group and, and mm -hmm. Vera Rubin. Yep. Um, the plan is to try to, they're still setting up the cadence of how it's going to be done and what areas will be covered. And so there's going to be a, a section of the galactic plane covered. It won't be complete across the galactic plane like CTF tried to do. Um, but that will give us some hint. If we can actually get all the numbers out of the sections of the galactic plane and get a real distribution for the height, Right. Uh, height distribution of these that, that will really help and, and Gaia will be continuing to put out more distances so we can actually get their their real brightnesses and, and how far away they are cool. uh, which is going to be a big height but again it's going to it's really and Z, uh, LSST is going to go much fainter um, we will not be able to get spectra for the confirmation for most of these yeah. I mean a, you know a, a 10 meter telescope can work down to 20 21st 22nd maybe uh, but it's going to be really hard, and most of the things are going to be down there 24th, 25th, 26th magnitude. There's not much you can do with those except for the light curves. So if we can get the machine learning right. to be better, there you go. We to train on ZTF, mm -hmm. and I think ZTF, uh, the current, I think the sec ZTF two, I think is for three years, and I don't know if they'll. I hope they'll try to extend because now uh, LSST won't start until 2024 at the earliest. Uh, so it'd be nice to have a little bit of overlap, at least go up to the yes. point where where it starts. Uh, yeah. So I hope that will that will happen. Yeah, very nice, awesome. I look forward to seeing the entire CV population in the galaxy map. That will be cool. <laughs> so do I. That yeah, will... that would be nice. I don't know if I'll live to see that, but <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, uh, it'll be great. So Paula, thank you once again for walking us through your, your lovely article. And uh, everyone, I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better and we'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.